All right. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Uh, my name is Raman Tabatabai. Um, I am coming from Los Angeles. It's nice to meet you all. Uh, on behalf of the entire EMA staff, we wish you all good luck and the best of luck during these four days that you're here. Uh, I am uh, the, uh, coming in as the program director next year at LA County USC. So I mostly speak with residents. This is a fun time for me to kind of get away from the resident crowd and talk to all of you. Um, I am also uh, a proud husband to my wife who's a nephrologist and a rambunctious one-year-old. My wife, because she's a nephrologist, as you'll notice in uh, the three years of me doing the EMAs, anything sort of related to the urologic or uh, kidney region um, ends up in my hands. So therefore, I'll be talking to you today about urologic emergencies. And we're going to talk about uh, just a few different topics. We're going to start by talking about um, catheter-related urinary tract infections. We're going to move on to talk about acute urinary retention. We'll talk a little bit about kidney stones, and then we'll really kind of pick up and talk about testicular and ovarian torsion, the things that make us really nervous. We're going to talk about med malpractice and how to avoid those things um, in cases of torsion. But we'll start off by talking about this term called CAUTI. How many of you, uh, have you have been have heard about this or had this drilled in your head by your administrators. What does it say for catheter-associated urinary tract infections? So is this a big deal, little deal, no deal, an annoying thing that administrators kind of beat us over the head about? Or is there a real reason they're hitting us over the head with this? Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's actually pretty significant. The, it, amongst all uh, hospital-acquired infections, CAUT actually has been shown to um, account for anywhere from 40 to 80 percent of these infections, right? So pretty significant uh, disease burden for hospital acquired. And then every day a patient has a catheter in place, uh, the chance of them getting an infection increases by about 5 percent. In response to these numbers and this problem that we've come up, that we've had develop in the uh, ED world and in the hospital world, the CDC in 2009 came up with a set of recommendations that's right there in the front. You see that big chart. Um, that's probably posted on everybody's emergency department right now. I'm going to try to boil this down to the three major reasons that we need to put in catheters in the ED. If you go through this checklist of three things and they don't have one of these, it's more than likely that the patient doesn't require a catheter. Number one, they have acute urinary retention. Big bladder, needs to be decompressed, it would be cool not to put a catheter in. Number two, they have like multi-system blood trauma, they have prolonged immobilization, and they need to get one put in. Of course, we do it for that. And then the last reason is, if they're a critical care patient going to the ICU and they need urinary outputs fairly regularly, like your really, really bad cardiogenic shock that you really need to check the, mon the I's and O's as you're, uh, as you're uh, treating them, okay? And outside of that, there are not too many other indications. Yes, like palliative care is, a, is an indication for comfort and patients with ulcers and things. But if you think about those three things, you'll hit most of them. The first abstract basically shows that if in a, a bunch of EDs with a bunch of patients, if you took this CDC guideline and you told the doctors and nurses and providers to do this, do you think their rates of infection went down? Sure did. The, catheter, the rates of catheterization went down by about half. Patients did much better. So just basically the bottom line for the first abstract is if we use those guidelines, it tends to um, translate into improved outcomes in terms of less catheters and less infections. Now, the, there's another New England Journal article uh, that looked at bladder bundles um, to look at kind of ICU versus non-ICU patients. And in the non-ICU cohort, the rates of catheterization went down. But in the ICU, the dial didn't move at all, which shows it kind of highlights a little bit of a problem that we have in ICU patients when we admit there as sort of part of the standard order set for a lot of ICU docs still, the catheter just kind of goes in. That's kind of the area that we haven't really uh, changed things too much, all right? Um, so I'm going to move on. We're going to talk now about acute urinary retention, all right? The first, uh, the abstract number two, the first thing we're going to talk about is um, whether using, how many, how many folks are still seeing people like clamping um, catheters or still like seeing that in the, yep, yeah? one. If I asked this 10 years ago, how many people would have raised their heads? A lot, yeah. So this practice has largely fallen by the wayside, so we don't need to belabor this point too much. But this was a German paper that kind of largely was the basis for us 
busting this myth that we need to clamp all these acute urinary retentions. The idea being that if they have a large volume of uh, urine in their bladder, and then we put a catheter in and we just let it rip, that they could get pretty hypotensive, and then they could start having hematuria and all these kinds of things, right? So these authors took about 400 patients, they randomized them, uh, excuse me, about 300 adult males, they randomized them into getting clamping versus no clamping. And they looked at the rates of hemodynamic compromise and the rates of hematuria. And what they found was that it was exactly the same. Uh, people did tend to drop their blood pressures a little bit, um, but it wasn't significant because what are people's pressures when they have a bunch of urine in their bladder? They're usually high, they're angry, they're in pain. So when we drop their pressure, it doesn't end up having any kind of clinically significant outcome. And then they had hematuria in that group about 10% when they just, we just kind of let it ride, but so did the patients that got clamped. So hematuria will occur whether or not we're clamping them. The one exception that I have sort of clinically um, that we talk about with the residents is if you have somebody who has acute urinary retention and is infected and is almost in shock, they have soft blood pressures to start with, Again, when we let the, put in the uh, catheter and we dump 1.2, 1.5 liters of fluid out, it will drop their blood pressure. If somebody's starting with a blood pressure of like 90, 95, that might be the one instance that I may consider clamping um, for them just so we don't drop their blood pressure too much. All right, abstract number three is basically asking the question, for patients that have acute urinary retention, will alpha blockers, like tamsulosin, will alpha blockers help in achieving a trial without catheter. And this whole concept of trial without catheter, you put in a catheter in any patient, when do they want it out? Yeah. Now, <laughs> 10 minutes from now. <laughs> Yet, wh when do we usually tell them to come back? Who said, loudly? What you? Three days? Yeah, so some will say three days, some will say a week, some will say two weeks. Do we have a really good basis? behind telling them when they should come back? Yeah, the, the literature is sort of conflicting on this. There's been um, some, some studies that show that seven days is better than two days, studies from the 80s and 90s. There's, there was a big French observational study of like 2,600 patients that showed um, that patients that had it um, three, at three days, removed at three days, um, did better than patients that had, it, uh, had better um, success rates than if they had it for longer. Now the problem, what's the problem with that, looking at patients strictly in that way? The patients that have it in longer tend to be the ones that have irreversible causes for their acute urinary retention, right? If someone has a UTI as an inciting factor, the chances are you could get it, treat their UTI, and in three days you take it out, they'll do better. If someone has a big old prostate or a spinal injury or something for their urinary retention, chances are that's not gonna get better in three days. So it's kind of a case by case basis. But what they're looking at in this, in the, uh, abstract number three, it's a best evidence report. They looked at um, a Cochrane review and some other studies, about 3,000 patients, seven trials, and they looked at patients that got alpha blockers with their acute urinary retention versus no alpha blockers. And the patients that got alpha blockers did slightly better than the ones that didn't get alpha blockers. For me personally, if I get someone with BPH, it's the only thing that when I put in a catheter and I say, come back in a week, or go to your urologist in a week, or primary care, other than putting in the catheter, just rationally, I can't think of any reason that they're going to be better in a week. Like, is the catheter going to push their bladder, or their prostate out of the way in a week? So in, in my mind, I'm like, well, at least I'll try the alpha blocker and see if I can relax some of their, their smooth muscles. In some patients it works, in some patients it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, the chances of it not working for another trial of void is higher. And then if they fail a couple times, the urologist will usually um, recommend some sort of intervention like a TERP. So I kind of like to lay out some of those expectations for them ahead of time. So let's move on to kidney stones, ureteral stones. Abstract number four. I love this one. Can the risk of ureteral stones be predicted clinically or with a clinical prediction score? So abstract number four, if you read the title, predicting ureteral stones in emergency department patients with flank pain, an external validation of the stone score. How many have heard of the stone score? This was a paper that came out a few years ago. Uh, or 2016. Uh, so the Stone score was initially derived in Yale and then subsequently validated in this study at Harvard. So when you look at the score, just kind of peruse through some of the, some of the, uh, the components of the score. Gender, 
duration of pain greater than 24 hours, less than six hours, nausea, vomiting, hematuria. So basically the score is telling you that if somebody comes in with acute sort of colicky pain with vomiting and hematuria, that you should think about a stone. That helpful? This is like a bunch of really smart people from Harvard and Yale come, that came up with a really, in my mind, a really dumb score. That's pretty, yeah, on, and then if you actually look at the numbers, if you stratified them into the low risk category, the low risk category, if they had a zero to five score, 14% of them still had stones. And in the high risk group, 10 to 13, 76% had stones, meaning that you miss one in four that actually had stones, even if they like, go on the high risk. And the authors conclude that sure, th this score can help stratify. This is crazy. This is one of those things, and you, you hear Jerry Hoffman talk about this a lot. We'll talk about this on the panel today in terms of clinical decision tools or clinical decision rules. When you see something like this, like the stone score, and you see, like, you know, and the reason I bring this up, I get a lot of interns or people that are just starting out in emergency medicine that say, hey, I think I have this stone patient. Let me see if I can apply this rule or tool. And it's helpful when you haven't seen patients before or been exposed to this, but I guarantee you that anybody in this room if I gave you a patient that looked like this, you would do a better job of diagnosing st stones than this score does. And you wouldn't put patients in low risk if they were like 70 years old and had flank pain hematuria. You'd still be thinking about other things than stones. You wouldn't put them in the, because you know, the high risk group, you'd also be thinking to do more than consider stone in those patients. So. Um, just a little uh, commentary on clinical decision tools. Oftentimes, they don't compare these tools to what clinical gestalt would look like. And I think that if they compared this score to what everybody in this room would do, I guarantee you guys would be doing better. Therefore, not a great rule or tool. The next topic, what's the role of ultrasound in diagnosing ureteral colic? So you'll see as we go through this course, we're going to be talking a lot about ultrasound and its diagnostic characteristics. This is a particularly interesting topic about the utility of ultrasound as a first-line um, diagnostic modality for patients with suspected stone. So let me ask, just kind of getting a little bit of a survey in the room. How many folks, if you get a patient, 28-year-old guy, flank pain, colicky, radiates to his groin or testicles with some hematuria, and you're considering stone, how many of you are getting a CT non-con to start? First-time stone. Okay, how many are starting with an ultrasound? Uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. How many are starting with a point of care ultrasound? How many are starting with a formal ultrasound? So a very small minority of the group. So it, it, actually everybody that first responded is exactly in accordance with the 2012 American Urologic Association guidelines which say, state that first time stones, um, should, we should get non-contrast CTs, and then after that, subsequently, if they're already known to have stones, then you can get ultrasounds to follow them after that. But that sort of is a, that was 2012. Since 2012, there was a huge study in the New England Journal, kind of a game changer, possible practice changer. 2014, it's not in this article, in this, uh, paper, in this EMA chapter, um, but it's alluded to in abstract number five, it's the 2014 Smith Bindman study in the New England Journal of Medicine. Right? And this study, they looked at about 3,000 patients in 15 emergency departments, and they randomized them to either getting, they, the pa patients that had suspected nephrolithiasis, either got ultrasound to start, either point of care or formal, or they got a non-contrast CT. And they followed these patients for a while, and they looked to see at 30 days, did they have any adverse outcomes? Did like getting an ultrasound versus getting a CT, was it associated with any worse outcomes? In terms of what are the things that we'd miss? Like did they get septic, did they get sick? Did anything bad happen to these patients? And it turns out all the patients had about a 0.4% complication rate, irrespective of whether they got a CT or an ultrasound. And the authors in that study sort of advocate for, hey, why are we scanning all these people, these first-time stone patients that are low risk to begin with, don't really have a bad burden of disease? Why are we scanning them in the first place? We could get an ultrasound and refer them. Now, what's the, the obvious problem with that is the CT is far superior in diagnosing stones. 
If we want to see exactly how big the stone is, where it is, and how to talk to our urolo uro urology colleagues about what the stone looks like, we'd have to get a CT. But the question is, does it matter? Does the management of a kidney stone depend on all of that? And the answer to that is sometimes. Because if they subsequently become asymptomatic and you assume they passed the stone, they probably didn't need any urologic follow-up or inter intervention in the first place. In those patients that have persistent symptoms or the pain doesn't go away, those patients subsequently could go to urology and may need a uh, further imaging to diagnose exactly where the stone is and what kind of uh, intervention they're going to need to do, right? So this, is a, this little article here is pretty interesting, and if, if you have time, take a look at this one. It's a pro-con debate. It's short read, it's about two pages, and it's two urologists. One of the urologists is advocating for ultrasound as a first-line modality, and the other urologist is saying, hey, wait a minute, the gold standard is a CT, and let's stick with the CT. So I'll give you both sides of their argument, and there's no right answer for this, but kind of to kind of stimulate some thought. The um, pro-ultrasound urologist is basically making the argument that, hey, that test that we get doesn't even really affect management right away anyway. The second thing is he alludes to the smith bindman study talking about it doesn't change outcomes that much. And then they talk about um, the CT. What are the negative effects of getting a CT in all these patients? Number one, we find all these other incidental findings that beget more downstream testing. The other thing is the radiation. And why are we radiating all these like 26, 27 year olds that we know have a stone, that they, we can't possibly think of anything else that they would have. Sure, in the 65, 70 year old vascular path, like you, you wanna get a CT and make sure they don't have anything else, other things going on. But in those lower risk patients, like, it's probably okay to either get an ultrasound or do no testing at all and sort of treat them expectantly. That's the ultrasound uh, point of view. The CT perspective says, wait a minute, no, 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 no. Uh, first of all, we have these low dose radiation protocols, CTs, that have that now you can get them at like 1.3 millisieverts, which is the equivalent of two KUBs. So getting the CT doesn't expose them to that much more radiation. If you have that protocol at your hospital and you ask for it, these patients can actually get these CTs at a low radiation if you're less than 200 pounds. If you're more than 200 pounds, it's a little bit higher radiation. Um, the other thing is, the urologist will have no idea, like you can't be referring people for stones to a urologist, it's a frustrating thing when we have no idea what the size of the stone is and where it is and we won't know how to, how to intervene. So you kind of get both sides of the argument here. The beauty of it is we get to decide what we want to do. Um, I think sort of as a result of like those 2012 guidelines and sort of the standard of care had been previously to get non-contrast CTs as a first line, I think there's a little bit more room to play now, these days, that if you really, really think um, it's a stone in a young patient that's low risk, I think ultrasound, bedside ultrasound is a fine modality. You could even consider a formal ultrasound, but in terms of resource utilization, and you have a busy ED and all those other things, is a non-contrast CT indicated in every case? Probably not, but this is, there's some room here for shared decision making with the patient. All right? Uh, so what about pediatrics? The next uh, abstract, abstract number six, uh, in kids. There's a small study here out of the University of Michigan in abstract number six that looked at 42 kids who actually had kidney stones. And they looked back to see what kind of diagnostic testing they had. And in 90% of those patients that had confirmed stones, 90% of them had it um, demonstrated on either a KUB or an ultrasound, which is in concordance with the AUA guidelines also that state that as a first line for kids, a KUB or ultrasound is just fine before having to proceed to a CT. So in adults, the guidelines still say non-contrast CT as a first line, but you could subsequently follow them with ultrasound. In kids, KUB or ultrasound is the preferred initial, initial test. All right, abstract number eight just talks about the contrast, uh, non-contrast CTs and the radiation doses that we just talked about. They, they're just no, the bottom line is just know that there are low radiation protocols, and if you haven't heard of them in your hospital, just discuss it with your radiologist when you're sending, um, sending patients in, especially young patients, to get non-contrast CTs. See if you can get them in the low radiation protocol. Abstract number 10 is an interesting question that comes up sometimes. Uh, what's the risk of a UTI being present in a patient with nephrolithiasis? So you get a patient with a kidney stone, 
And now you're trying to decide whether or not that patient also has a urinary tract infection. And so what they did in this study is they, they got all these confirmed C, uh, uh, CT confirmed kidney stone patients and they sent off urines and urine cultures on them. About 8% of them ended up having UTIs. And then they looked and said, well, based off the initial UA, if there was uh, pyuria, in other words, if they had greater than five white blood cells on there, could that tell us, was that predictive of the UTI based off the final gold standard for, in the study, which was a culture? So if you get a patient with a, like white blood cells of 10 in their urine, how often is that actually a UTI? So in this study of about 360 patients, it was about 86% sensitive and 79% specific, which means that about one in five, we miss, if you get uh, white, it, like, it, the, in the absence of pyuria, if they had no white cells, if they had zero white cells, still about one in five of those ended up having a UTI based off culture. And then in the ones that ended up getting treated for UTI, one in five actually didn't have a UTI when it came down to the culture. And then they looked at all the characteristics that actually predicted having a UTI. Hey, that's confusing. So I have this stone patient, I'm treating them for stones. Why was I thinking about UTI in the first place? So you looked at all the positively predictive um, associated factors. And what were those? If they had a fever, sure, of course. Subjective fever, if they had chills, dysuria frequency, of course. Duh. But the interesting thing was, in female patients, the relative risk was about 27. So female patients had a much higher incidence of, uh, of a UTI in the, in the setting of a kidney stone in, in a lot of times without any of the other associated signs. So this brings up the interesting question of, which they, the authors state that consider getting a culture on these patients, if you get a UA and it's positive, um, consider getting a culture to see if it's actually a UTI, particularly in female patients. Has it changed my practice that much? If they have no symptoms of urine, urinary tract infection and nothing else going on in a male, I'm just not, I'm not sending cultures and doing that. But in females, I'm starting to consider it based off this study. Uh, abstract number 11 is a weird study uh, asking about IV hydration, whether IV hydration is important in the treatment of, uh, of kidney stones. So you get a patient with kidney stones and a reflex is to put in an IV and hydrate them up real, real bad with like a bunch of IV fluids. Is that necessary? We don't know. And this study doesn't really help us. It's a, real, a small randomized control trial of 40 patients in Duke in 2006. Half the patients got 500 mLs an hour. Half the patients got 20 mLs an hour. And there, there wasn't much difference in the rates of like stone passage. Wait, but when we're given IV fluids, I doubt people are doing 500 mLs an hour. We're just given a couple boluses and trying to hydrate them up. I don't think it harms that much. It's just a, another question of resource utilization. It's probably just as good to give them I, uh, oral hydration. The patients that I reserve IV fluid hydration for are the ones that are vomiting and can't tolerate PO. I think it's fine to give them hydration. We're probably all dehydrated at baseline, and especially if you're vomiting from your kidney stones, I think it's just fine to give them. This study is saying like it doesn't make much of a difference to give them IV hydration, but I think there's a subset of patients that it's just fine to give them in. All right, we're gonna move on, spend the last five minutes talking about testicular torsion and ovarian torsion. All right, abstract number 12. What are some of the mistakes made when assessing a patient for testicular torsion? This study is called the State Appellan Cases of Testicular Torsion, a case review from 1985 to 2015. This was a review of the Nexus-Lexus database. And basically they looked at all the litigated cases of testicular torsion over 30 years. And they found these 53 med mal cases over that time frame, of which 35% had emergency physicians involved, okay? And in those cases, we wanna know what happened in those cases so we don't do that. And so what happened in those cases? What did these cases look like? The first thing was, these patients tended to be a little bit older than your typical age range. They were more in the upper range of the adolescent range, like 17 years old, 18 years old, um, where we start considering it a little bit less. The other was atypical presentations. A lot of these patients came in complaining of abdominal pain instead of my testicle hurts and it feels like it twisted, right? So they're coming in saying a, a belly pain. And so you can imagine a nine-year-old, if a nine-year-old, does anyone have kids? Eight, nine, ten? So when a nine-year-old or a kid comes in and they're a little bit embarrassed about anything going on down there and they have belly pain and testicular pain, what do you think they're going to tell their mom or their doctor about? <laughs> 
they'll probably start by talking about the belly pain. So just the consideration that when kids come in with lower abdominal pain to always consider the testicles, and that happened in a few of these cases. The other thing, and this is probably the most important part of it, is that ultrasound does not rule out testicular torsion. And uh, quite a few, 16 out of 25 of these cases where they did get an ultrasound, 25 of the 50 cases, got, the patients got ultrasounds. 16 of them were false negative. So the radiology read came to the doctor or to the provider, and the provider said, hey, that looks good. The ultrasound looks great. I don't think it's torsion. I think it's OK to send them home. And that is the critical pitfall. And that is basically the theme that is repeated over and over again from this abstract, number 13, number 14, number 15. I'm not going to go through all of them individually. But just realize that in all of these abstracts, one of the main issues is that the ultrasounds, when they're negative, doesn't necessarily mean they don't have torsion. Okay, so let's add some, a couple layers of nuance to that. Why is that? Part of it is, there's a, it, it's not a dichotomous decision. When an ultrasound is negative, it's not just positive or negative. There's a few things that not all ultrasound techs are looking for, not all radiologists are looking for, and not all of, all of us are not considering. So there's really three really important things that we want to consider when we look at an ultrasound. The first is the grayscale. This is the one that your techs and uh, radiologists are most familiar with. Hey, there's some heterogeneous um, appearance to the testicle that looks like there's some areas of ischemia. That looks like torsion versus it doesn't look like torsion. Fine. The next thing is, whether or not they have both arterial and venous flow on the ultrasound. And they have to have both. So you can imagine if a testicle is tors torsing and, and um, occluding off part of the artery, when the, the tech looks at it, it could still look like they have flow. It'll just look more like venous flow. So if they, if they only have venous appearing flow, that's concerning. You want to know that they have both arterial and venous flow. And the third thing is, there's a, th a concept of high and low resistance flow. So when the patient has a systolic, when they're, uh, they're in uh, systole versus diastole, when they're in systole, they have their high, high, res um, high resistance flow. So they'll get real good flow, a peak of flow in that, in that stage. But then when they're in diastole, if that flow goes back to zero, that's a problem. You want to only see some baseline level of flow. So you'll see high resistance flow and low resistance flow, high resistance, low resistance as they go through their blood pressure cycle. And if they go all the way back down to zero on diastole, that's a concern. All right? So you can see there's some nuanced things in here that not all of our techs and radiologists even are thinking about, and not all of us are thinking about. And I, and I wonder, if you applied all of these to those med mal cases, how many then would be false negative? It's still possible that it would be, because of the next thing I'm going to tell you, which is how many have gotten a read that says there is high flow on the ultrasound concerning for epididymitis? You say, oh, gosh, this must be epididymitis. Can testicular torsion present with high flow? Yes. And when is that? Detor exactly. So they torse, their flow goes away. They detorse, all of a sudden they get a high flow state for a period of time. All of this goes back to say that as you're charting on these patients and as you're evaluating them, if your clinical suspicion is still high, they're getting this on, off, on, off thing, and then their ultrasound is negative, it's not enough. Call the urologist and get, you get them evaluated. Um, in other countries, in Germany and Ireland, and you'll see in a bunch of these studies, they actually take all these patients to surgical exploration. All of them. Like, depending if they have like an absent cream asteric reflex or they have all these other things, they'll take them all to surgical exploration. I think that's probably a little extreme to explore every kid's testicle that comes in with acute scrotal pain. But I think having, putting it in some clinical context and saying, hey, look, this, this is concerning. It doesn't sound like epididymitis. It doesn't sound like other things. It sounds like torsion to me. So, and then one more, one more thing before I kind of walk away and we'll get to the next, uh, next talk. Uh, cremasteric reflexes. How often are they negative in the general population of men? About a third of the time. And then they could be present in about 40% of testicular torsions. So that in and of itself doesn't help to rule in or rule it out, unfortunately. Um, and the last point I'm going to make is about ovarian torsion, which is the last two abstracts that we are 
also pretty bad at, uh, the gonadal salvage rates are even worse for ovarian torsion because we don't consider it as much. Um, when a patient has an ultrasound with a greater than five centimeter mass in the setting of acute pain, that's highly concerning for torsion. In the pediatric population, the patients that we do miss, the med mal cases, the 14 and 13 year olds, if they have a story that's really good for torsion, a lot of times they won't have that five centimeter or greater mass. In adults, most of the time they do, but in kids they won't. So if you have a really good story in a pediatric patient that sounds like ovarian torsion, I would still, and you don't have any other cause for their abdominal or pelvic, for their pelvic pain, I would consider talking to OB for those patients. Okay? All right. That's all for now. Uh, and we have, uh, thank you. Thank you for your time and attention. We'll chat a lot more about all this stuff for, through the next few days. 